I want to just start by reading this blurb that was on the back of um, Winston's first collection that was published by Las Gaspin. When was that published? In the last century, uh, in the in old, old century. In the old century, uh, yeah. so the, the, 19, good cent the good century. 94? In the good century, yeah. And um, it's from Jello Biafra, who was the founder of the Dead Kennedys, obviously, for those wondering. If, if you don't know who the Dead Kennedys are, I'm sure you can find them on those <coughs> Spotify things or whatever. Um, so look them up. But anyway, this is what Jello Biafra wrote on the back of Winston's book. One day, a postcard arrived at my house with a Zapruder film still, a JFK's head exploding. If you want more, write back, it said. <laughs> I never answered mail back then, but this time I wrote back. Who is this weirdo? <laughs> back came a packet containing wild collages and a photo of the artist in a military graveyard in Italy wearing a gas mask. Who is this weirdo? Have I found a fellow partner in art crime? We've bounced graphic terror off each other ever since. Album covers, college inserts, collage inserts, Dead Kennedy's logos and more. All with the goal of using wicked humor to penetrate minds at large and inspire. I've never lucked into this sort of relationship with any other artist. Jello Biafra. So, I thought that was a little introduction for you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> on the back of your book, it was really good. So, I was going to really ask as well, on, also in, in the material you gave me, you describe yourself as a punk art surrealist, and I wondered if you could elaborate on this uh, title that you've given yourself. Well, I, I kind of copied other people who said that. And, uh, I don't have any original ideas, <laughs> but um, it seems like all my life growing up as an artist, I was mostly influenced by surrealism the whole period from the 1920s mm -hmm. and 30s. Uh, the era of your granddad's career beginning. And that um, kind of seemed to be blossoming again with the punk movement in the 70s and 80s, uh, that it was kind of a not a repeat, but a... Uh, a return a, to those values, a, those surrealist values. Exactly, yeah. and um, it, it was spontaneous, especially in musically, everything had become stale yeah. from the 60s Because, rock because the surrealist Dada movements were revolutionary in their intent, so it was punk rock in a way. Yeah. Right, and it's like the periods of, of, um, of artistic expression from the 19 teens, when the, before the First World War, and then the wartime, post-war, and then, uh, then pre-war of the 30s, and then the post-war of the Second Global War, and the beatniks, and then the hippies and the freaks, and then you know, rock and roll, um, ossifying into you know stadium music, and the punks were like wanted to wipe all that away. Mm -hmm. and, Start fresh. And I yeah. think they and after thirty or forty years, they're still at it. Which did you, it, did you did you agree with that that they should wipe that all away? I thought. Or did you did you, did you think well there are elements of it that really are do need preserving? Well, unfortunately, because I was uh, in San Francisco at that time in the late nineteen seventies, I was a roadie for different rock bands, and I saw what a huge machine it had become. Uh, no more spontaneous, um, uh, you know, gleeful, uh, you know, make a joyous noise. <laughs> it was uh, a business, and I mean, it's always yeah. been that way, but in this case, it really had gotten that way. And people who would go on stage during the, the punk era of the late 70s and early 80s would go on stage and have no idea what they were going to do and just wanted to entertain people, or just wanted to entertain themselves. A lot of it was just them being silly, but it was, everyone had five or 10 minutes to go on stage to make a fool of themselves, and a lot of it was just brilliant. It was like vaudeville that had come back. Mm. You know, they 
they single-handedly brought vaudeville back to life. Right. And I, I think, in, and some people never repeated it. They just did that, and then they went on to other things in life, and it was not a career move, and and I thought that was inspiring. Mm. And, cool. Um, um, so, we'll get to punk a little later on in this interview, but we need to, the images that have been shown on the screen involve collage, which is your main medium, isn't it? Um, and I just wondered what it was about that medium that you, the first, you got first attracted to, what was it, that you like to do? I mean, did you paint, did you draw? Yeah, um, my mom was an artist, she was a painter and a sculptress, and, and she could paint like, you know, Raphael if she wanted, I mean, she was really excellent and well-trained, and I didn't have any of that, uh, Patience to learn the step-by-step -step procedural thing you had to do to mix colors and turpentine. I just wanted okay. to get instant gratification by taking a pencil wow. and, and drawing a picture. So I've always been able to draw, but um, and used to draw better when I practiced, but never got the hang of the skills and the disciplines that are required to make sculptural art or acrylics or oil paintings. But the house was surrounded, you know, we had bookcases and bookcases filled with art books. And we didn't have a television when I was a kid, so I, I would spend the evenings, you know, going through the books. And uh, at school, my friends would talk about what happened on TV the night before, like uh, Wagon Train or Beat the Clock or uh, other silly, you know, Lassie, the dog, Rin Tin Tin. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't know what they were talking about, so I was like the outsider. And mm -hmm. because I didn't, what it, it dawned on me at the time that these people were all having the same dream, and the dream was coming off that machine in the corner of the living room, and they were getting it spoon fed to them. And that's why they happily accepted whatever was being put yeah. in front of them. Uh, I was kind of an oddball. Uh, did you, did you, did you, <laughs> even at that stage, did you, did you feel there was some sort of uh, malignancy about that, shall we say? Well, it's like, I guess I would say that I thought everything was a, 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 a trick or a conspiracy, but everything is. I mean, it's not even a conspiracy, it's just how things work. Uh, um, and I also saw how. You know, at that time, children were much more honest and brutal about their uh, judgments about one mm -hmm. another. And if someone was not on the in group, you were on, in the out group. You know, in group good, out group bad. And that was an early lesson that, you know, made me not want to join anything. You know, Boy Scouts or mm -hmm. you know, the Army. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? um, Edwin, are you guys talking to the microphone? Oh, oh, sorry. Are we not? Oops. Technology is dangerous. Is this thing loud enough? That's better. Is it? Better. Hang on. You're the one who's not on. One, two. Say something. Two. Wow. Right. <laughs> Yours is louder than it's mine. Louder than me. Yeah. 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 Anyway. He can ask the next one. Okay. That may be the only word I get to say tonight. <laughs> We're getting paid by the word, so... I know. That's I, 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 I right. <laughs> why I keep going. Uh, that, that sort of imagery that you found to collage, I mean, collage is a very precise sort of art. You have to sort of figure out, well, this image will work well if I place it against this image, which will completely, you know, subvert what the message is supposed Ru to be, the original, the original, the original yeah. message is supposed to be saying. Um, so, I just wanted as well that if along the way, while you were rooting through all these fifties magazines and things like that, whether you were actually appreciating the actual art itself, say, I don't know, like um, Norman Rockwell or something. My my mom loved that kind of art. Also, the artwork that I grew up with. I, uh, I was born in 1952, so all, our houses were filled with all the magazines and books that came out every week. 
Life Magazine, Saturday Evening Post, uh, and so the the artwork that they have for commercial art to you know sell a bottle of dish soap or whatever product it was um, was all painted because photography wasn't good enough to be reproduced very sharply. So they just had they hired, if they couldn't get hire Norman Rockwell to do something, they hired somebody who painted that style. Yeah. And um, my mom has always encouraged me, you know, you should become a a commercial artist. Little did she know that by the time I grew up, they wouldn't need commercial no. artists any longer because now they can just snap a picture of a lady holding because up she, the Because she probably thought, well, that's where the money is, you know, do that commercial yeah. art. Yeah. Uh, I, I, one time she said I should have gone to medical school and become a surgeon because yeah. of my cutting. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but I was, a, I was a disappointment as a son, I'm afraid. <laughs> I, I didn't live up to her expect uh -huh. expectations, but also these things, uh, they were all so wholesome. The pictures are, you know, wholesome pictures of families. Yes. Always Having dinner and um, always celebrating Thanksgiving and yeah. getting a new car and a dishwasher oh, yeah. and everything. It was all the post-war uh, boom that other countries in, in Europe and Great Britain, for example, they didn't have that booming economy because the U.S. was the only country left that wasn't brought to its knees to to uh, um, advertise plastic radios and a new Lincoln Continental automobile, a new, uh, uh, new clothing everywhere else. I, I have friends who are my age and, and, and maybe just a little bit older who had memories of their childhood in Italy going without shoes until they were 10 or 11 years old because their folks didn't have the money to buy new yeah. shoes every two years when your feet grew. Yeah. Um, and you know that was kind of a, a shock to find out for Americans that had no idea that the rest of the world lived like cattle, and you know we had the standard of living that was completely artificial and built on the backs of the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, we had that to a certain extent. I mean, I mean, all three of us are from the fifties, aren't we? In a way, that's, where, that's, where, that's the era we're coming from. We're coming out of the Second World War. You know what I mean? With the sort of post-war baby boomers in a way yeah. um, and everything was sort of fashion to sort of say that everything's going to be all right now you know everything's beautiful everything's you know we've got, we've got all this new technology taking over and everything and you don't have to worry about it anymore and I think you want when to it, create an artificial eu uh, euphoria uh, yeah make people feel an artificial euphoria stable and so, and so I suppose that when we grew up and we could look at it again in another way and we rejected it, that came as a horrible shock to our parents and peers, you know what I mean? Yeah, they, they just weren't expecting us to do that. They thought we'd be grateful for it or something. Yeah, I, I bet they were sorry they won the war. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, while we're talking about the Second World War, um, John Hartfield, who was your grandfather, um, who was the German anti-fascist and you know anti-Nazi photo montagist, very very brave man <coughs> working in that period and almost like a soldier of art really, um, and surrealist, you know, um, Max Ernst as well. They they were influence, influential on your work as well, didn't they? Paul. Oh. Uh, absolutely, I, I, I probably should. Uh, um, jo John could declare me on his taxes as a, a dependent, uh, <laughs> because his grandfather's work was such an inspiration. Um, How did you come across these these I, artists' work? I didn't know about Hartfield's work until it was when the Democratic convention was happening in San Francisco in 1984, mm -hmm. and a friend of mine showed me a book that was as thick as a phone book about all of Hartfield's pieces and his, his life and era. And I thought, where has this guy been all my life? I, I've, uh, and I, I had seen a couple of images in uh, school books, but I didn't know who had made them. That one about the church that looks like bullets, it's right. bullets made out of a church. Mm -hmm. And um, I was so happy to, to discover it. So it also was nice to know that it wasn't just, you know, my whim to make these anti-authoritarian things, that there was actually a solid backbone of experience, artistry behind this and went back a couple of generations. And then uh, 
you know, when we would do these things that were anti-authoritarian, it was for laughs. You know, it was like down with Big Brother, you know, or you know, down with Nixon yeah. or, or LBJ. But when when your granddad was doing this, they were going to hang him if they could find him. Well, was, they could find yeah, him. They, yeah, they, 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 they did try to hang him. Put his they head tried on, to kill on, him. on a stick. Yeah. Maybe you could tell us a bit more about your grandfather while we're, while we're, on, while we're on this particular area. Just, just a lot, just to, just to, uh, just to, lot to tell, us, what would you like just, to well, well, I'd just like to sort of, um, maybe you could just give us a short, a short, brief, you know, biographical portrait. Sure. He was born in uh, Berlin in uh, 1891, and uh, his parents were rather mentally disturbed, and the father moved the... Uh, family around the countryside because he would write these plays that everyone wanted to throw him in prison for. And uh, finally the father decided it would be a good idea to take them all out to a cottage in the woods. At that point there were four children. Uh, my grandfather was, it was 1899, he was eight years old, and the other three children were younger than he was. Uh, two sisters and a brother. And one night, uh, shortly after they moved there, the uh, father just left. And then uh, probably about three or four days later, the mother just got up, Alice, who uh, had problems later on, just got up and left. So now there's four children in the woods, uh, all alone. Uh, and uh, my grandfather is walking around and saying, calling for his mother. And I tell that story because I think it, it shows that very early in life, he understood that unconditional love was for animals. You could not, and unconditional love was not for people. If you love someone unconditionally, sooner or later, bad things were going to happen. As well as he had a tremendous uh, feeling against injustice. He took everything that was an injustice as a personal affront. So we'll pop ahead. He became an oil painter, and then uh, he met George Gross. And uh, basically the Dadaists came. Uh, Dada started in 1916 in Switzerland. And then Richard Kielsenbeck, the writer, made a speech in Berlin in 1918. And Club Dada started with uh, critters and... Hannah Hawk, who everyone should love, know and love, right? Hannah Hawk, and uh, my grandfather and George Gross. And George Gross and my grandfather did a lot of work together. And basically the idea there was, if, if the whole world was changing. It was a quiet place around the turn of the century and suddenly there were radio waves and automobiles and noise and Gross said that, you know, if you wanted a flower or a human being, then you should just take a photograph. That was what you should do. Um, but if you wanted to make art, you had to do what Winston does. And it's very funny because when you were talking before, I was thinking a lot about Winston and, and Winston's collages. And I think what happens in Winston's collages, he says, well, I you know, didn't want to be a painter, is there's a lot of truth. A lot of truth comes in your collages right away because you use real things to make your collages and then you put them together to tell your truth in your collages and it all comes together that way. You know, I mean, not, you're not just painting some truth out, you're like putting it together. Uh, so I'll jump I've, ahead. I've tried to make them look like, be like uh, alle allegorical right. images. Right, exactly, yeah. Like in the old days they yeah. make allegories of you know, truth, beauty, justice. And, right. And in this case it's what we've surrounded ourselves in our um, consumer world yeah. with those standards that are sometimes artificial and, and usually misrepresented, but to have them uh, you know, two bad bad things put together sometimes make well, makes one good thing. It's like right. Two wrongs actually do make a right. Right. <laughs> Like when you use a bomb coming down on your collages into the oh, right yeah. into a suburban backyard. Yeah. There's what, there's something more to that than just painting a bomb in, in a suburban backyard. I, you know. uh, so 19, 1921, 1929, my grandfather um, did the graphic designs for a, a publishing house called uh, Malik Verlag, 
which was run by his brother, and he did all the graphic design, and he invented a lot of things. He revolutionized typography. He invented the concept of a book cover that tells a story from the beginning of the book to the end, and he began to tell social stories. He began to tell stories about how a young, uh, a young, an old Jewish man was sitting on a corner looking at his past, and then on the, what's it called, the middle of the book, the spine, spine, the spine, spine. spine he had like a young boy looking at his future on the back of the book. And now he, he comes into what he's most well known for. He's uh, 1930, 1938. He did the phonomontages of the Nazi period, uh, which were satiric. They always have to be satiric. You're right. They have to be funny, and they have to be satiric. And he, he answered Nazi propaganda, which was extremely good, with, with humor. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, humor. Powerful. Uh, right. Showing a light on Precisely right. Just what you said. You're tragically funny. <laughs> yes, very. Well, yeah, I was like, if Gore, if Goring said, you know, that uh, iron made the nation strong and butter made the nation fat, then my grandfather said, yay, there's no more butter. And he did one of those political collages. He did 240 of them from 1930 to 1938. Think about that. That's almost one a week from from conception to thought, to answer, to making the collage, to taking it to the rotogra of your masters, to yelling at them for screwing up his collage, and <laughs> to going home, to work seven days a week on three hours a night's sleep, and um, made the Third Reich angry enough that um, when Hitler, uh, went through the Enabling Act, took over, and was the uh, complete was the chancellor and complete control of Germany in March of 1933, April 14th, 1933, Easter Sunday. The, the SS came to assassinate him. Yes. He was uh, he jumped through the door as they were banging on the door. He jumped through the French windows of his apartment. He landed badly on his ankle, crawled to the back of the alley, and stuffed himself because he was five foot two, which is about there, and about 40 kilograms soaking wet, into a trash bin. And of course the SS were walking around, you know, and no SS officer could ever believe that someone would go into a trash bin. Yeah. So they ripped apart his office, his uh, apartment, and they destroyed all, much of his art. And then he walked across the Sudeten Mountains to Czechoslovakia, where he continued as a wanted man, uh, same thing. <coughs> Excuse me. 1938, when the Germans invaded uh, Czechoslovakia, there were 85 people on the most wanted list. The Gestapo was most wanted list. He was number five. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's a grueling to hear about, much less imagine someone doing that. Maybe getting lost in the woods as a kid was a good preparation for, you know, it's like a Hansel and Gretel uh, story. Well, I skipped over the part where he was, uh, he was brought up Protestant, and the mayor of Eichen who took them in was a Protestant. <clears throat> I'm sorry, the mayor was a Catholic. He was brought up Protestant, and he was uh, eventually such a rebellious little boy, they sent him to a Catholic nunnery where they beat him mercilessly. So he learned very early on that authority was not that great a thing. Well, if thank you for that. Thank you for that. That's sure. very interesting. Authority yes. is not your friend. No. Winston and I know that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd like to ask you about two UK photo montages now. I don't know if you know them. Peter Kennard, who did a lot of anti nuclear posters. And G. Voucher, who worked closely with an arco punk group, Crass. I don't know if you're familiar with their work. Yes. Uh, and what do you think of it? G.'s work is just amazing. Biafra used to give me their records, um, uh, their, you know, 33 and a third uh, yeah. RPM records. I didn't have a record player. I lived on a re remote ranch in the woods in the middle of nowhere. I had no electricity, no running water, no telephone. It was it was like 18th century. I, I had kerosene lamps and 
And so I couldn't even play the records, but I could read all the lyrics and look at the pictures. And I thought the pictures were photo montages. And then years ago, when I, I uh, 89 would be 25 years ago, and went up to CG at, at Dial House, and she was showing me the originals. And instead of being very big pictures that were reduced, they were very small pictures that they had to enlarge. Mm. And they're not photographs, no. they're, they're paintings. Yeah. She uses like a one hair brush to paint. It's just insane that that I didn't think that could be accomplished. And, um, um, and of course she thinks nothing of it. It's like, oh, you can paint like Raphael. This is, yeah. And, oh yeah, I just did that. You know, uh, she's very humble uh, 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 about her talents. Um, uh, the other artist, I think I have seen his artwork, but I don't know the name. But I, uh, Protect and Survive, the the, and, then, and then it's like a skeleton with an atom bomb gas going mask, up, yeah. Yeah. and then a gas mask with uh, nuclear right. missiles oh, coming yeah. out of the uh, then I do know the picture. And things like that. Yeah. Yeah, those are, you know, been great influences, and, and for years, uh, the only reason I have any books at all is I was trying to assemble a bunch of my photocopies to send to the crass guys just to say thanks for the inspiration and hear the, and then someone was looking at them and they said you know a book made out of these would be so weird and that kind of you know gave us the idea maybe we should like see if we can dig up a publisher to yeah to cough up a book and uh, that was the beginning of uh, our you know partners in crime uh mm -hmm. era can I, can I say something about Yeah, sure. When, when you say Crass, you're talking about David King? Dave King. The, Dave King, uh, Dave the, King, Crass. Uh, we did the, yeah. the logo, the incredible logo yeah. for them. There's, there's a John Hortville ex exhibition online. I encourage all of you to type in, like, just the simplest ways. Go, you know, johnhartfield.com or just type in Google John Hartfield because th there's a lot about my grandfather in there, but there's also Winston's. Uh, pieces, which are beautiful. Oh, we yeah, on the exhibition, and Dave, Dave King, has one. I love one of his pieces, which is USSR. You know, um, yeah. As you, you should go to Dave King under uh, um, current events, reveal art, and look at it's Mickey Mouse mixed in with a uh, hammer and sickle. Oh. And he did this way, way before the uh, Russia thing with America. It's just brilliant, brilliant piece of art. Love it. Yeah. yeah. He lives in San Francisco too. The, yeah, I met him through Winston. Yeah, crass were great. I mean, uh, just doing these astonishing, and as as well as a, a Politico oh. band, you know, an, an, yeah. an anarchist band. Yeah. You yeah. know, on, on the, like Kennedy's were as well. Punk stencil artist. Yeah. That's where he is. Yeah. So, as we're talking about rock and roll. Uh, you were a roadie for 60s groups like Santana and Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. When what I was this like? Well, I had been in, living in Italy for six and a half, nearly seven years, and I came back and trying to find work in the U.S. was not... If you have no record of what you've done before, I didn't go to school here, here or there. <laughs> uh, didn't have any you know, connections. I only could do what I had already done Back in Italy, I had roadied for a couple of bands, and uh, so I wound up, you know, working for two dollars an hour, which was a minimum wage at the time. Um, maybe I don't know now, maybe you know, six dollars an hour. And the local bands were these pretty much world famous bands, but they're all local guys. And I wasn't a musician. I've never been. I don't play anything. Uh, most people were in that kind of work only because they wanted the connections and mm -hmm. I just needed to pay the rent. And, um, uh, but unfortunately, I, that was right about the same time that punk rock was rearing its ugly head. And it was the antithesis of what the rock and roll world was had become. Yeah. And that's why it was refreshing to see people making silly two minute songs over nonsense. And a lot of them then were you know, quite politically and socially um, active even when Jimmy Carter was president and now we wish we had him back again yeah. but, uh, but people at the time you know didn't like him they didn't know that Ronald Reagan was right around the corner yeah. 
Um, We're going to get to him soon. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, you've already answered that question, the question I was going to ask you next. But uh, when I when I wrote out the intro, when I read out the introduction, it was, uh, it was about you writing to Cello Biafra. I mean, I just wonder what prompted you to write to him. Oh no, yeah, because um, this is what I tell people sometimes when they ask, you know, what should a young artist do and I said the best thing is to volunteer and so at the time I was volunteering as a layout artist for a group called Rocky Gets Racism which um, I think started in, in Great Britain but there was a chapter in San Francisco we put on shows uh, punk shows at the this old temple it's called Temple Beautiful 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 old deconsecrated uh, synagogue elegant woodwork it was just like a palace and uh, everyone, you know, treated with great respect. And uh, a friend of mine who worked with me on the newspaper for Rock, Rock Against Racism kept saying, you should meet this friend of mine. He thinks just like you. He has a band and, 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 and you guys should meet. And I thought, well, that sounds suspicious. Maybe he's insane like me. And her friend was Biafra. And so I didn't know anything of Dead Kennedy's. I didn't follow that. She dragged me over to the Mabuhi Gardens one night. We got there just in time when everything was closing down. And uh, so that was my, the connection. Um, and she said, you should just drop a postcard to him. I, I don't know, what's his address? And she gave it to me and I dropped in the mail and then he wrote back. And the weird thing is we didn't have telephones. And I, no one I knew had a telephone. Um, people connected by through the written word mm -hmm. it was to sell you know letters and weird yeah. things like that yeah it's like a cuneiform uh, tablets um, no email smoke no email you know, no such thing and um, um, uh, so that's kind of how we got in touch in this very old-fashioned way um, um, it, it was a process of, of, of um, kind of slow you know um, awareness and, but I, I've always said to people, all, you know, volunteer, because volunteering will lead you into different things that you might discover things that you've never known you had either a talent for or an interest in. And uh, even though, you know, you don't get paid for volunteering, you develop uh, uh, a, uh, a regard for other people yeah. and their interests. And Just make that connection. And making the connection, yeah. Yeah, and if it, if, it, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. It's not really harm done. Oh, yeah, I mean, in this case, you know, Biafra and I would probably look at it as like uh, uh, being utilitarian, you know, using our friends to advance our own careers. But I figured if you can't use your friends, who can you use? <laughs> so, so, so once you'd established this sort of creative relationship with Jello Biafra, um, how did it? How did that work? Did you discuss ideas with him? Did he discuss ideas with you, or did he just wait for you to come up with something and say, "Well, I can use that." Well, I would I show him that. portfolios I had of work I'd done a couple of years before, and and the first time we were out with uh, uh, his fiance and and my friend Melody and and a couple other friends, and he looked at one piece and it was a piece done two years earlier of a cross of dollars, and he said. That's what I want to use for my next record. And he didn't tell me this until about 20 years later. He didn't have any next record. And he, he said he had to go home and like write songs you know, that would fit to the imagery. And, and so usually it's the other way around. The imagery comes after the body of musical work is, is composed. And I, I wish he told me, you know, because he probably didn't want me to get big head about it or something mm -hmm. but uh, uh, he, he uh, very subtly you know, ur urged me to come up with new creative ideas and I would he would not I, I didn't hear the music he would write down the lyrics and send them to me in the mail so I would oh, just right. see okay. the poems and I'd come up with something that was vaguely you were almost the, like illustrating the lyrics yeah in, in fact that the 28 page booklet that came in one record, uh, Plastic Surgery Disasters. Each picture, each page is supposed to illustrate a song. Uh, there was one, oh, it's on the wall, but it's gone now. And it's one guy, and he's surrounded by a million cameras. And uh -huh. uh, it was uh, 
I call it the paranoid nightmare, but you know, which is now in Great Britain it's the most surveilled country in the world, the CCTV. Yeah. Um, but it was for a song called "I Am the Owl" about government uh, government surveillance. And it turns out, in reality, it wasn't government surveillance. It's now corporate surveillance mm -hmm. that's much more intrusive in our privacy than you know. Big Brother ain't watching us. Big Brother is selling us. You know, he's it's not like lots of little Big Brothers, <laughs> little brothers everywhere. Um, that first image we were just talking about, which is called Idol, wasn't it? The collage. Idol. Um, showed an image of Jesus crucified on a cross of dollar bills, and in 2007, you modified that image as humanity hanging on a cross of iron, where you replaced the money cross for one made of guns. Um, I just wonder if it had the same reaction that the original had. It, it was almost worse. Um, some people didn't care about the money part because I was saying, well, this is like the new, the new god, the new idol, people worshiping money, which. Uh, I've tried praying to it a few times, but it hasn't worked yet. But the, the one made of guns. The, the, but the one made of guns was just because of all the, you know, especially in the United States, the culture of violence is so it, it permeates everything. And I just I, we just heard what was it the other day, two days ago, some crazy went into another school and killed ten people. Yeah. Sure. I, I you know it happened so frequently, it's hard to keep up with. Um, but we have hopes and prayers. Yeah, that's that's there. If that worked, it wouldn't be a problem. Yeah. That was actually going to be a record cover for Ben Harper, um, uh -huh. musician. And when it was just about to be published as a record cover for his new record, there was uh, the slaughter at a rock and roll venue in Paris and oh, yeah. people got the, um, killed. The uh, IS thing, yeah. Yeah, at, um, at the sidewalk cafes. And so Ben and his record company said, you know, we probably shouldn't use that right at this moment because this is like the worst thing. Yeah. And uh, I, I've, you know, only continued to use it because for me it isn't about, you know, social terrorism. It's about national yeah. personal insanity of... Um, Lax laws in the United States, in, in particular, uh, that well, and I don't know what happens other places. To, to me, it reads like it says, if you don't mind me being so crude, uh, it does what it says on the jar, sort of thing. Um, it's about you know uh, worshiping guns. Oh yeah, yeah. It's a gun culture, and and um, so what did the NRA see it? No, I wonder, you know, maybe they would probably adopt it as, as a new, they probably think, cool, yeah, that's, that's we worship, right? Yeah, they probably will, actually, come and think of it. Yeah. Maybe, uh, probably I should, wouldn't have a big t-shirt. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll wait and see if they send they me a check. think it's a compliment. Who knows how the, uh, uh, people misinterpret things. I mean, even when the Cross of Dollars came out in England, there was uh, huge posters, like, like as big as this entire screen of the cross of dollars drew such ire from people they closed uh, the, the record comp the record shops had to take them down because there was an old law on the books here that was an anti-heresy law but been on the books since the 1680s or, and they dug up these laws to say you can't do that you're criticizing the deity and I, so no, it's not the deity. It's it's money, <laughs> and, and it's just amazing. You cannot be too subtle for most people. You have to yeah. hit them over the head with a two by four to. It, you know, there's no such thing as subtlety. Um, yeah, I had a different reaction to both of those pieces. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the uh, when I looked at the cross of money, it was yeah, right. And when I looked at the cross of of uh, guns, it was no. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm angry. This is wrong. You know, it was completely just by switching your symbolism around. You you gave us the audience, or at least this piece of the audience, this completely different reaction to the piece of the art. You know, um, that both of the things are like equal. You know, okay, we worship money or we worship guns, but I don't think most Americans worship guns, but. But there's a completely different emotional reaction yeah. in those two pieces. We, the title was called Humanity Hanging on a Cross of Iron right. because it was a, a line from a speech, like I think the retirement speech of 
President Eisenhower in the, in the late 50s, and he said every every cannon that's made, every every gun that's manufactured, every rifle that's cast represents a theft from the poor that have no food to eat, the uh, uneducated who have no education. Uh, it represents humanity hanging on a cross of iron. And that was the, the military industrial the complex. complex yeah. um, you also did a magazine called Fallout. I don't know if you brought any along, but it was a beautiful tabloid collage paper that you produced yourself, I presume. Yeah. Yes, I, um, we, everyone did zines at, at that time, you know, little Xerox photocopies. I made mine at like a, a Rexall, uh, like a dime store or pharmacy, and for, for 10 cents you could make uh, photocopies. And you would just fold them in half and then staple them. And some of them were, of them were elaborate. People did like whole, um, you know, giant magazine uh, things. And I wound up, you know, making Fallout as a big format thing. I think we only had one or two real adverts that people had actually paid real money to help publish it. All the other adverts were invented and all the bands were invented. They didn't exist. We just made up names that were silly names of improbable bands. And um, we even made up the name of the, the venue, the nightclubs. And I put posters around San Francisco. People would wind up going to these addresses that were like <laughs> vacant lots. It was, I found some people later on that were really angry, like, Ooh. We went all the way out why. to this, the thing, yeah, in the middle of like Friday night, we, and we couldn't get the bus back, and you bummed our entire weekend. And uh, sorry, I, I didn't know it was actually going to be believed, but uh, it's like regular propaganda, you know, it's it's always lying to you. Um, but the so that way it was a cabin kind of art joke. It, it was yeah. a joke. It was a prank. Uh, a prank. Yeah. How many issues did this prank take before, before people finally got the the first? Two were done so small, we only did, you know, a uh, hundred of them on um, a Xerox machine. The rest took place over the next two years or so. They were published irregularly, you could say. And um, then we did some several years afterward. And, and the latest one is kind of the, the one we did for the show catalog tonight. Um, but right about when I moved into the woods, my plan for subverting the dominant um, uh, culture uh, went underground, like in a physical way. I, I was so remote that I didn't continue. Uh, and it, it was, uh, what's the word? Spamantoso is an Italian word. It was frightening to find out that people had collected these things and, and you know, were, were influenced by them. Years later, I was shocked. I, I, mean, I was glad, that, you know, but I was shocked that, that was, um, had become a, a thing in my absence because I was essentially so far away. It's like the story, I don't know if you know, it's an American story, Rip Van Winkle, the guy goes off yeah. hunting in the woods and he falls asleep, asleep for 20 years yeah. and when he wakes up, everything has changed. And that's kind of what happened to me when I was gone for like 15 years on the this <laughs> ranch. And, and coming back to find out that there, it's like planting the seed, and then later on you see this flower coming up to a tree, and and I was glad people interpreted it the way I would have wanted them to. But art is up to the eye of the beholder. Um, did you ever feel a part of the punk rock movement? I mean, did you feel like an like an active part of it, or were you we we would do were you basically just contributing to the. No, we would do performances. Uh, a couple of friends of mine did. We did like stage performances, but it was Dada at that time. It was a re, it was a resurfacing of Dada. In uh, uh, the, the Dada never went away. I never mean, went away. No. And if you listen to John Lennon really, or, yeah. or or David, well, David Bowie was already said he was heavily influenced by Dada, and uh, if you listen to I Am the Walrus, you yeah. can't think of. Yeah, completely. Yeah, completely. That's about the most Dada song you could possibly words. imagine. 
yeah, I was at the Data World Fair and I opened one of my one of my talks with uh, "It's wonderful to be here." It really is a thrill. <laughs> it's such a lovely audience. I'd love to take you home with us. Because yeah. uh, you think about the you know, Sergeant Pepper's completely Data album. Yeah, yeah they carry on a long tradition. Yeah, it's also it's like I just came from Liverpool which was really great. There was a wonderful festival called Time Tunnel in Liverpool. And I was on a panel with, uh, with one fellow who had made a life of collecting sex pistols memorabilia. Um, and uh, he went so far as to go to the bank and try to borrow 15,000 pounds to buy like a sex pistols book. Imagine that, going into a banker and saying, I'd like 15,000 pounds, oh, I'm going to buy a Sex Pistols book. He had a Sex Pistols uh, lunchbox, as a matter of fact, yeah. And it, the incredible thing about punk is that it, um, it has come, in a way, <clears throat> full circle, because the University of Liverpool, he didn't know what to do with this, he had a huge archive of Sex Pistols material, and there's a show right now uh, in Liverpool called uh, Sex, Sex Pistols Beatles, right? In the University of Liverpool, the dean of the University of Liverpool uh, is going to take this huge Sex Pistols archive and make it into a public you know, a gallery and, and keep it as an archive because the guy donated it to him. And just as a close, it was, you know, uh, in America now, um, you know, My Way by the Sex Pistols is, is, is on a commercial for a very high-end, expensive car. Yeah, it's uh, vicious, the rolling is great. Yeah, now. right. Um, probably, and, probably not. <laughs> and so I, I, yeah, the guy who that. made the collection, I, he knew that all of them, the Sex Pistols. So I, so I said to him, well, what, what would they think about that? And he said, it's a commodity. Ah, they called their reunion tour the Filthy Lucre Tour. The, fo the Filthy Lucre Tour, that's correct. It's a commodity. But that was bound to happen, wasn't it? I mean, it, sure, was, it, was, just, it, it was inevitable that punk would become, you know, just... Even corporate. poets must be fed. Exactly, yeah. yeah. It was delayed though longer than say the flower power movement got co-opted by the uh -huh. by the press and got co-opted by fashion and you know because it was pretty and colorful, whereas the punk scene was so underground and, and ugly and slimy and and, and uh, perk, but, perk but, some. But you can make a lunchbox out of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, I, I, you don't yeah, lose your appetite. <laughs> my wife like you know starts thinking of music after the seventies and I, I don't think. I can ask her if she's over there. But I don't think, you know, when she heard the Sex Pistols, I don't think she thought, oh my God, revolution, you know, ba boom, boom. She thought, wow, this sounds great, right? And mm. she dug it uh, as music, not as, not as a revolutionary movement. Mm. Yeah. Uh, return to the Kennedys for a minute. I mean, the most famous sort of um, imagery you did for them was sort of stuff like um, involved images of. U.S. President Ronald Reagan. Yeah, he let was, them eat jelly beans. Yeah. Mainly because Ronald Reagan used to eat jelly beans a lot, didn't he? He used to eat a lot of jelly beans. Ronald Reagan. He, it's something he must jelly have said in speech. Yeah. 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 that probably didn't help his intellectual prowess. <laughs> All that candy, <laughs> um, and that was a bumper sticker for, for for cars. It was inspired during his run for the president. He was governor of California twice, mm -hmm. so he'd already been, you know. I think it was a mixture of. Marie Antoinette and Ronald Reagan. Yeah. Like she them. said, let them eat cake. And he said, let them eat jelly beans. I don't think he actually said, let them eat jelly beans, did he? No, that was something I came up with, yeah. you know, parodying uh, Marie Antoinette. And one time I was stopped in the mission on the, in what we call the People's Republic of 22nd Street. And um, this guy was, a, he had like a Ferrari or some Lamborghini, a beautiful Italian sports car. Nearly ran me off the road to stop me. And I thought maybe. Did I scratch his car or what? I'm just driving. He gets out and says, man, that bumper stick you have on, uh, do you have any, where'd you get that? Do you have any more of those? I said, oh, I made that. Do you want, to, you want one? And I, you know, I gave it to him for a dollar. And he held it out and said, 
yeah, let them eat jelly beans. Fuck those people. And he, so he actually was thinking, yeah, the hell with those people. You know, let them go starve. Um, because he, so he interprets like you know the NRA could interpret yeah. my thing as pro gun. Like we were just talking about. Yeah. yeah and and uh, how weird. What how a, does this feel though to be misinterpreted that way? I made a buck off, off it. <laughs> <laughs> Filthy lucre. <laughs> so, 